In the 21st century, nearly all over the world, people are enslaved. The sale of flesh makes about $31.6 billion every year. At any one time, about 2.4 million people are starved, beaten, and forced to work for little to no pay, says the United Nations. Of that 2.4 million people, 80% are sex slaves. But statistics represent only the tip of the iceberg. Millions more could be victims. But unfortunately, it's extremely difficult to gather accurate information because of the underground nature of the crime. According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the sex trade is the fastest growing industry in organized crime and the third largest criminal trade in the world. And trafficking schemes can range from large to small. Investigators report they've busted everything, from international criminal networks to families making a profit off sex. And identifying victims is often difficult because they're typically among groups society shun and criticize. But there's always a story behind every single girl that has to go for prostitution. Natalie Cameron says she was among the most vulnerable. She comes from the poorest country in Europe, Moldova. Natalie says she never knew her father, so when her mother became blind, four-year-old Natalie had to move in with her grandmother. Three years later, her grandmother left her in an orphanage. You're just a number, because in my orphanage we were almost 800 kids with the same story, the same pain, different backgrounds, but eventually we are all end up in the same place for a reason, you know. According to Natalie, in Moldova, when teenagers turn 16, they're kicked out of orphanages with only a bus ticket and several dollars in their pockets. When I was in the orphanage, I tried to dream, but at the same time, the world that I was living in was telling me something else. You'll never succeed in life. Nothing plus nothing will always equal nothing. Fortunately, a ministry scooped up Natalie before it was too late. And I was so close, two days before I was about to be put on the street, Stella's voice came. Stella's voice provides shelter, food, and education for the orphaned and abandoned in Moldova. Natalie says she's one of the few from her orphanage to escape the streets. But that was not the case for one of her closest friends, Valentina. They took the innocence away from that girl. And... She was like my sister because I grew up with her, so it was really hard. Natalie says Valentina became a prostitute because she had nowhere else to go. No little girl, when is growing up, sits in her bed and says, Oh, I want to be a prostitute. Nobody has that dream. Life took them there. Valentina dreamt of becoming a teacher. Instead, she was sold to man after man, night after night. <sighs> Valentina told Natalie that the worst moment of her life happened Christmas Day in Greece. It was then 95 men raped her. Shortly afterwards, Valentina disappeared. I don't know how they do what they do. I don't know if they have a heart. I question that. And I don't question many, many people if they have a heart or not. But those are the people that I do question the most. Valentina is one of millions sold into slavery around the world. The first country she was trafficked to was Cyprus. Because of division on the island, traffickers can set up shop more easily on Cyprus than in other countries. In 1974, fighting broke out between the Turks and the Greeks, forcing the UN to divide the island. To the south of the border lies the Republic of Cyprus, which is part of the EU. To the north is the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. The international community, including America, says Northern Cyprus is illegally occupied. Turkey is the only country that recognizes TRNC. Northern Cyprus can skirt international law and regulations because it's a rogue state, creating the perfect environment for sex trafficking. Since TRNC is not recognized, this part of the island is 
totally isolated from international pressure, international community, international law. Jiren Gorik is a lawyer and president of the Refugee Rights Association in northern Cyprus. She says TRNC is doing little to help victims of sex trafficking. As of 2014, northern Cyprus has yet to add an anti-trafficking law to its books. It's not possible to eliminate it, to fight it against it, and also to protect victims. Gurik says traffickers lure victims into TRNC with promises of good jobs and money. They were told that they are going to work as housekeepers and domestic workers and nannies and different uh, jobs. But when they came here, they realized that they are working for prostitution. In 2013, more than 1,300 women worked in nightclubs and bars licensed by Northern Cyprus. Everybody knows that prostitution takes place there. Also, government actually accepts the fact that prostitution takes place there. Government officials often act as middlemen in the sex trade, even though prostitution is technically illegal in northern Cyprus. By law, women must hand over their passports when they arrive to work in places known for prostitution. Authorities will hold on to their documents until they leave. The law also requires women working in nightclubs and bars to get tested for sexually transmitted diseases every two weeks. It's difficult for them to run away because they often owe money to their traffickers for travel expenses and housing. It can take them several weeks, months, and even years, if ever, to pay off their debts. If they try to escape, victims are arrested and deported to Turkey. Those are some of the reasons why the U.S. State Department considers northern Cyprus one of the worst areas for sex trafficking. The reason why officials help traffickers is simple. The sex trade is a booming business. They pay huge amounts of taxes, and this shows that demand is way huge. Unlike TRNC, the Republic of Cyprus is working to fight this crime, but U.S. officials say Cyprus has a long ways to go. Between 2011 and 2012, the government substantially increased its number of human trafficking investigations, prosecutions, and convictions. The U.S. State Department says authorities investigated 47 new cases of suspected trafficking in 2012. In 2011, the country only investigated 29. But in 2013, anti-trafficking efforts in Cyprus lagged behind the previous two years. Last year, investigations plunged 68 percent from 2012, with officials opening only 15 new cases. Prosecutions plummeted by 70 percent, and convictions dropped by 55 percent. The majority of traffickers were convicted of lesser crimes. Some even avoided jail time altogether. This injustice makes victims even more mistrustful of officials. They will be frightened to tell the truth because they, they are afraid something will happen to their families. And unless we start with their fears, it m might not be that successful to get enough evidence from her. Alina Baducci is from Moldova and helps trafficking victims from her country. She says Cypriot officials often overlook the significant trauma victims have endured. We had a case of a girl. She was trafficked and she was told that she will be resold to someone else. And when she heard it, everything was happening in a hotel. She just opened the curtain, opened the window, and it was fifth floor, and she just jumped out of the window. She didn't remember anything besides the fact that she jumped from the window. And it took her like three to four months to start to remembering. Even if victims seek help, the representation they get in court is often inadequate. And seeing that he has a lawyer and you don't, makes you realize that you might not be that safe or that much protected. Often, victims are deported to their native countries, entering into yet another unsafe situation. She will feel rejected by her family, by the community. People will say, like, everyone knows what happened to you. You were probably a prostitute abroad. And returning home with no money increases the likelihood they'll be trafficked again. The environment she's coming back to is even worse than the one she left from. She was missing and she's coming without money. 
if she was already having debts before she left the country, now the debts are even bigger. For many victims, these debts are impossible to overcome. As a result, many of them turn to the only trade they know, prostitution. But where do you draw the line? When does prostitution become sex trafficking? This stereotypical picture of a girl tied up and locked in a room is not your typical trafficking victim. Instead, many trafficking victims are out in the open, appearing as if they're free to make their own decisions. But Natalie Cameron says this is far from true. The hurt and the pain they put in those girls' hearts, I would never know because I've never been through it, but I've seen firsthand girls that have been trafficked. And I know how broken they are. I know how ashamed they are. They are breaking their spirits, their lives, their families, their future. And I want to ask them if it was your wife, if it was your daughter, because I know most of them have families. Would you want them to go through the same thing as you put the other girls? But like many human rights violations, the victims are swept into the underbellies of societies where they're out of sight, out of mind. And nearly 6,500 miles from Cyprus, the United States is grappling with the same issue. In the United States, people generally think that this is a foreign national problem, that this is something that happens overseas. They think it involves transportation or movement. They think it uh, has to occur in urban areas. And we find that none of those things are the case. Assistant Special Agent Margie Quinn is with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. She's in charge of the Bureau's efforts to fight human trafficking in Tennessee. Quinn says no community in America is immune to sex trafficking, not even rural areas of Tennessee. According to the TBI, of the 21 counties that reported the highest number of sex trafficking victims, 17 were rural areas. You don't have to get a foreign national child or young girl or young boy to traffic. You can get an American girl, a Tennessee girl, a Tennessee boy to traffic. And there are thousands and thousands of them all across this state that go missing or are reported missing every year in our state. Um, and they are ripe for victimization. Too frequently, the abuse starts at home. Uh, many of these women are first abused by their mothers, and that, I think, would be very surprising to people. I think people typically think, oh, well, they're probably abused by their fathers or an older brother or a cousin. No, many of these women are abused uh, at, at their mother's hands first. Quinn says she knows of one mother who sold her daughter to a drug dealer when she was 13. That's the average age a person enters into the sex trade. When you have a girl who's come up with that sort of background, um, who's been made to have sex with her mother's parade of horribles from the time she's five or six years old. Is it a big stretch that she's gonna go out and sell her body for money? For Sheila Simpkins, sexual abuse was part of everyday life. She was just 14 when her body was sold for the first time. At, a, at an early, early age, I was conditioned to think that it was okay for men to, to touch me, and I thought it was okay for for me to give oral sex, it's because that's stuff that was taught to me as a child. And so really, whenever I ran away from home and met the pimp, it was, it seemed almost better because he perpetrated like he loved me. Sheila suffered years of rape, physical, and emotional torture. She turned to drugs to cope with the trauma. When I was a child, my dream was not to grow up and be a prostitute addicted to crack, okay? The reality of it is, though, Selling your body is pretty degrading, okay? And you are going to find something to help medicate the feelings that come behind doing what you do. Sheila has been trafficked from Florida all the way to California. At one point, Nashville, Tennessee was her main spot. And we would work uh, up there at Park Plus Boulevard, and we would stand out there 10 o'clock at night till 6 o'clock in the morning. That was our shift. When Sheila did not earn $1,000 a day, her pimp severely beat her leaving behind emotional and physical scars she'll carry for the rest of her life. Beat me in my head with an iron, a six inch stiletto. I got a hole on my head, literally. Pieces of wood, wire hangers, whatever he chose to pick up to beat me with. They beat the head up because they didn't want to damage the face because that was their money. And then after, 
they beat you up. They put your head under cold water until the bleeding stopped and then tell you to get over it and get back out there and get the money. Sheila would sometimes have to serve more than a dozen Johns a day to make what she needed, and she never saw a penny. Because you'll find that most of the men are married. And you know I've had some Johns that actually paid me extra money not to use a condom, not worrying about what they're gonna take home to their wife. Quinn says many perpetrators are looking for young children. There are individuals out there who are trolling for very young girls and they're willing to play. He was willing to pay $5,000 for two hours for a girl that was just over eight and not over 16. The, the youngest girl that we know of that's in treatment right now in Middle Tennessee is three. And if there are plenty of Johns, there will be plenty of victims. As long as there is a demand, there will be a supply. I think if he's got a, 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 a younger girl, um, I think he's making anywhere from, I think on a low night, he's making $500. And I think on a good night, he's making two grand a night. And he can work her seven nights a week. The sale and purchase of sex has moved beyond the street. It now feeds on the World Wide Web. If you just look at, uh, at Backpage.com, for instance, on any given day, you'll see ad after ad that says, only in town for two days, just back in town, leaving tonight, last night special. Uh, so we know that these uh, victims being transported all over our state, our region, our country, catching them and the perpetrators who are promoting uh, this activity, very difficult. But merely shutting down websites would not fix the problem. Unfortunately, it's more complicated. You know, I understand why the attorneys general wanted to shut down Craigslist. You know, I understand that Backpage is one of the largest purveyors of, of sexual advertising in the country, um, but I'm not sure it really does us any good uh, to shut them down. Because we shut them down, they just go to another site. And many law enforcement agencies admit they're not prepared to tackle the issue. When the TBI published its report to the legislature in May of 2011, we were astounded to learn that of the thousand people that responded to our survey, 79% didn't think their agencies were adequately trained to recognize and identify cases of human sex trafficking. Because sex trafficking often involves other crimes, it's difficult to identify victims. Within a human trafficking case, you will see instances of domestic violence and assault, instances of rape. All of these things are occurring within that criminal element of human sex trafficking. And many victims are afraid to report abuse. It's a big myth that victims or survivors are gonna jump up and down and say, save me, save me. And most of the time they don't want to be saved or they don't realize they need to be saved. You've got repeats and repeats and repeats. Uh, and you see that with trafficking victims and kids that are involved in trafficking situations go right back to their traffickers. It could take victims years, sometimes decades if ever, to escape the lifestyle. Sheila says the abuse felt like a perpetual nightmare. I don't know how he'd find me, but he would find me. I mean, I ran from Memphis and went to El Paso, Texas. I was working at the Red Parrot. I'll never forget it. I was walking down the stairs from the stage, and there he was. And I'm just like, you know, damn, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be able to get away from this man. But drugs and a criminal record prevented Sheila from moving forward. She's been arrested about 200 times in 25 states. It's kind of hard to find people that truly care, that, that are willing to give you a second chance. Because if they look at your record and they see all, the, all, these, all these charges, you can't, you can't really blame them for, you know what I mean, having doubts about hiring a person. But then Magdalene House helped rescue her. The nonprofit provides housing, food, medical care, education, and job training for women who have survived prostitution, trafficking, and addiction. With the program's help, Sheila quit her drug habit of 22 years. I'm really okay with who I am today, you know what I mean? And my past is exactly what, that, what it is. It's my past. It's not, um, it's not who defines me today. Um, it is what made me who I am today, though. It um, helped me be the strong woman that I am. Today, Sheila works with Magdalene House in In Slavery, Tennessee, helping women and men escape their traffickers and get the best resources possible but many victims do not meet a similar fate. Lots of them end up on the streets, or worse, dead. Agent Quinn says in Tennessee, there are not enough places where people can turn for help. A lot of services for individuals who are convicted of crimes, a lot of rehabilitation services for a rapist or uh, a sex offender, 
nothing for the victim. The state doesn't pay for anything for the victim. Unfortunately, victims are often arrested instead of getting the care they need. But now, some states, including Tennessee, had to criminalize prostitution penalties for minors and enforce stiffer penalties against traffickers. In our state three years ago, it was a Class A misdemeanor to sell a 14-year-old for sex. Now it's a Class A or B felony. That conviction can come with a 12 to 15 year prison sentence. Even when their traffickers are placed behind bars, for victims, scars left by shame and stigma remain, and society does not help. Agent Quinn says people often see prostitution as a victimless crime, but she says that's far from true. Prostitution is an inherently violent crime. It is an extraordinarily violent crime. I haven't talked to a prostitute yet, a survivor yet, uh, that was not also a human trafficking victim. Uh, can she be a prostitute on Tuesday and a human trafficking victim on Wednesday? You bet she can. If what we need to prove is force fraud or coercion, we can probably prove that four nights out of the seven. Clinical psychologist and researcher Melissa Farley interviewed more than 800 current or recent sex workers in nine countries. Her team found that 75% had been homeless at one point, 89% wanted to escape prostitution, and 68% met the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. That's in the same range as combat veterans and victims of torture. I'm just sick of hearing people saying, I raise awareness, I told them about it, I want people to step up. Communities need to show more compassion for people like Sheila and Valentina and also recognize victims' capacity for resilience. Another great way to help is to donate to organizations that provide services to victims, survivors, and at-risk youth. Every donation, no matter the amount, can spur significant change.